Clouds of white and the bright blessed day and the dark sacred night and I think to myself what a wonderful world. Chapter six vocals. If you are walking around with a ukulele, there is a really good chance you're gonna be singing. For many years, I dedicated so much of my attention to the quality of the accompaniment, which is important, of course, but I neglected to examine the quality of the vocals, and, received, and I received a sharp reality check when I went into the studio and really heard my voice for the first time. And I, I'm sure I had the same experience as everyone else, and like, is that what my voice sounds like? <laughs> you know, and, uh, this does not sound good. I did not sound the way I thought I did. And apparently, like I said, I was kind of joining the club because I think everyone pretty much goes through that. This is the same cliche response that comes out of everyone who hears their voice for the first time in a serious capacity, like a recording studio. My voice sounded amateur and lame. And I mean, I, it wasn't cringy or anything like that, but it definitely lacked plenty. And over the years, I ment mentally jotted down some of the tips and tricks that I used to bolster the sound of my voice. And here are a few of those. Number one, pay close attention to the quality of your sound. And I'll be first to admit, I don't have any kind of showstopper voice, you know, but giving my own voice as much attention as far as tone and intonation and support and volume, et cetera, as I do the ukulele, did make a big difference. When I first started doing this, yeah, I can hear now the recordings that I do. It's, uh, it's substantial. Number two, support from the gut, even in soft passages, which I'm guilty of uh, breaking that rule because you know the last song that I did in the last chapter, I got to the very end and I forgot to really make sure I had enough air in there. You can probably, I'm gonna hear it later and you know, I'm going to be a little bit disappointed. So um, here's a good example. In choral classes, you know, there are several exercises that a teacher does with students that develops a learned sense of the vibration in your face. And an example of this is singing a phrase using z or n, you know, and they have you go like z, and it feels kind of silly when you're up there, but two or three minutes pass by and your whole face is buzzing. You know, you feel all the vibration. And the whole point of that exercise is to try to simulate as much as possible when you're singing words to get that same vibration because if that vibration is happening, you're activating all of the needed muscles, you know, to, to really get that full deep tone, and a much richer tone. Your voice will start to sound like a fine wine, aged wine, as opposed to like, you know, the sour club soda that I noticed when I listened to myself back. And the furnace or your engine of that vibration is supported from your belly. And I know this com next comparison is not the most attractive one to use, but, you know, please forgive me in advance for saying it, but I was told by a choral teacher friend of mine years ago um, that one really good indication that you're supporting yourself adequately when you're singing is if you feel like you're just on the brink of passing gas, <laughs> you know, that feeling. And, uh, you know, like his exact words were dropping a deuce, which I wasn't going to put in here, but I, I think I'm going to now. <laughs> so, but that feeling, that's the sweet spot, you know, as far as your belly support is concerned. You should, you should not feel your gut muscles flexing to the point of strain, but they should be poised and supported, you know, as if you were girding up your, your torso from beneath. Number three was one that took me a little while to learn this, but don't try to mimic your sound, or don't try to mimic or sound like a singer that you admire. Uh, this is one giant mistake I made for a long time, and I would hear others singing, and I would try to copy that sound, and it wasn't until my 30s when I realized, like, I asked myself, you know, wouldn't this sound just so much more authentic if, if it's just with my natural voice? <laughs> like, I know it was kind of a groundbreaking moment for me, but it seems really kind of stupefyingly obvious now, 
But I, I stopped trying to contort my mouth to sound like another voice and just said, forget it. You know, this is my own mouth and my own voice is the voice that I have. So it's the voice I'm stuck with. So I just said to myself that I should just sound like the same voice that I have when I'm speaking, but when I'm putting it into melodic form. You know, and I, by all means, I'm not suggesting that you forego all the vowel training and intonation, intonation training and diction and tone and stuff. Those are very, very important. But how silly of it was, how silly of me was it to try to sound like another singer? Like, not only is that copying someone else and making my voice sound strained, but no one would know it was sing me singing if they heard me. Like, it just seemed, seems really ridiculous now because uh, my singing voice wouldn't have been recognizable. So now when I go into a coffee shop or something like that, you know, and I'm talking to someone before they go on, you know, and then, then they go on stage and they're trying to sound like Dave Matthews or something, I just sort of think it's just weird. It's, it's a weird feeling. So give yourself that freedom. Music is hard enough as it is. I've, I liken it to the act of trying to juggle bowling pins and knives and torches, you know, angry cats and a couple of live grenades all at the same time. And, uh, you know, let your body deal with the musical on the spot nuts and bolts challenges like rhythm, intonation, tone quality, dynamics, harmony, articulations, form and arranging and audience engagement and finger dexterity and note accuracy, etc., 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 without introducing another unnecessary stress like altering your natural voice. It is really quite absurd when I think about how I would do that in the past and not realize how much it would have neg negatively affected all of the other elements of my performance. Number four, uh, alter the melody. So again, number four is to be used sparingly, you know, when you're singing a song. Um, but when you do it right, it does add a nice touch. If you remember from the last chapter, you know, on the, the, the ending hook of the bridge, you know, it's supposed to go, where you find me. But I did, you know, I did my own thing. I altered the melody a little bit. And, you know, people are often saturated in the melodies of overplayed cover tunes. And you don't have to sing the melody exactly as it appears in the recognized track. But again, don't get crazy with it. You want to complement the coolness of the ukulele with little melody twists and turns here and there. Unless, of course, <laughs> you're singing a song that has legendary recognition and the audience would be turned off if you didn't do it the way that it's supposed to be done. So uh, an equivalent of this on the guitar would be the solo from Freebird. You know, if you're if you're listening to a band play Freebird and you know and the guitarist didn't start out with that with that legendary like opening, you're screwed. <laughs> There's no one's going to listen to that tune. You're going to have all kinds of stuff thrown at you on stage. So it would it would def it would turn me off, you know, as the listener. So you got to you got to be sensitive to all this stuff. But that being said, changing the melody a little bit here and there seems to be something that could be done with the ukulele without backlash for some reason. You know, like, uh, I mean, you can do it with many instruments, but there's something about the ukulele that, that lends a kind of unspoken liberty. And I'm not sure why. It's the same kind of feeling I get when I talk about how that unspoken X factor makes the ukulele cooler. But uh, it works out more than not. Ukulele is almost as much of a joke toy instrument that it has a way of abandoning expectations. So uh, somehow this happens in a way that makes people ironically take it more seriously. And the last one, which is kind of cool, is the kazoo. Uh, it's pretty interesting. After playing ukulele for a couple years, I started carrying a, a kazoo around with me a lot. And this was mainly for the reason of putting in a little solo you know, section in the middle of my tunes when I wanted to fill it up with something different. And it's a really nice touch because it adds great character to a song that perhaps has a recognizable guitar solo in the middle of it, but you don't have the luxury of toting, on, toting along a, a guitar player with you. And a good example of this is like the guitar solo on Sublime's Santeria track. You know, everyone knows it, everyone expects it, and no one is ready to hear it on kazoo. So when they do hear it, the kazoo is almost a guaranteed delight for your listeners. But I also discovered something else about the kazoo that I didn't expect, and I noticed that it was the same problem I had when hearing my voice in the studio when I heard the kazoo. Um, it sounded weak and lame on the kazoo when I would play it. 
like a kind of like a kid was playing it. And wouldn't you know, it was for the same reason that my voice sounded kind of lame. It was because it lacked the attention that I needed to give it to have a good quality tonal sound. And now part of this was because it was a cheap kazoo. And, you know, and my, my first piece of advice would be to go online and get an actual good one. My children lost my good one, so I had to get this also cheap one. So yes, disobeying my own rules again. But I had you know, like one of those $50 ones you know, made of, I don't know, mahogany or something. It was really nice, handcrafted and all that jazz. Um, so that's the first step I would do is get a really good one. And it really will affect the quality of your sound and the quality of your performance. And eventually I started having my own students sing through the kazoo or play the kazoo. And what I found was groundbreaking information. If you can make a kazoo sound good, chances are your voice is going to sound good because you're activating most of the same muscles to pull that off. And uh, funny enough, the kazoo is pretty much considered the same kind of joke toy as the ukulele, and you put them together, it can make a really, really neat piece of music. Uh, but again, like I said, don't overdo it like everything else. I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't introduce the kazoo into a set list probably more than twice, maybe three times if the audience was really into it, but you don't want to do it a lot, is my own recommendation. All right, so... That is my chapter on the vocals, and you know, let me give you kind of let me give you kind of an example of what the kazoo could do. You know, if I was doing like the tune I did earlier, uh, "Closer Walk with Thee," so not only am I changing the mode and switching it from major to minor, adding in a lot of hammers and just other little techniques here. If you throw a kazoo in during a solo section, it is pretty neat. Walk with me. Granted, Jesus, hear my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Good to have around. Good to have around. Seems kind of silly, but it, it's, it's, it sure was helpful for me. And that closes chapter six, last chapter coming up, chapter seven, my musical philosophy. Oh Lord thy God, when I in awesome wonder consider I see the stars, I hear